Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. I am super excited for this webinar. Um, so today we're going to be having a conversation about the overlap of machine learning and DevOps and how we can use machine learning to really drive those DevOps adoption practices and principles. Um, so a little bit about our illustrious guest for today, far more interesting than me, I'm afraid. Um, just very quickly, I'm Chris. I am the uh, I'm a senior cloud engineer uh, here in the UK, and I'm also the developer advocate for CoreLogix. Um, and with me is Leo. So, Leo, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey guys, excited to have uh, everyone here. I'm one of the co-founders at CoreLogix, and in the last seven years, we've been building algorithms. Uh, some of them, I had my own pleasure to write to make sure that we're bringing uh, monitoring to the next level using machine learning. Very good. And good algorithms they are. Um, so today, what are we going to talk about? Um, machine learning is, is something of a, uh, an abstract topic. Um, it's certainly for myself as well. My background is very much in DevOps and cloud engineering, as well as normal application engineering, but I've never really crossed into that machine learning world. So we're going to have a bit of a conversation about machine learning, why it hasn't really crossed the chasm into uh, very, very common usage. Um, also about what's missing in the normal DevOps stack that machine learning can help. And we're going to get into how machine learning works. We're going to get my, probably my favorite part of the whole webinar is deep learning explained. So we're going to really explain with a case by case example, how deep learning actually works and what you can expect from it. And we're going to bring all of that together towards the end with a case study that explains a real life, um, software engineering problem, how it's solved with machine learning and what the outcome is. So, um, Without further ado, let's get into it. Um, why hasn't machine learning become more normal yet? So um, my experience as a software engineer is quite uh, quite straightforward. I use Prometheus and I have some alerts and I love them and uh, they, they work, they're, they're okay. Um, but Leo, why, why is my first instinct when I go to my alerting or whatever, uh, not machine learning? Well, first of all, I think it's a great question because you know, there's, when looking at, at the classic monitoring of, of any software of any kind, um, alerting is what comes into mind. I want to know about specific events. And whenever software was so simple, as in 10, 15 years ago, simpler, not so simple, never was so simple, but simpler than it is today, it wasn't you know, distributed across any place in the globe. It wasn't scaling to any scale that you want in seconds. Uh, you had access to the hardware itself. So it, it become, it became distributed. It uh, put a lot of out uh, of, of um, so pieces of software that are outside of the organization, open source software and others. So it basically becomes harder to monitor. But you know, looking at machine learning, um, it has become very easy in these days to actually deploy machine learning models on top of any data set that you want. It has been like this for maybe the last ten years or so. So it doesn't actually answer why it's, it hasn't become the norm for any company to bring machine learning on its own without any, any external services whatsoever. But the thing is that even though machine learning is very, is very easy to get these, um, to get these ready-made algorithms to run and train on top of data sets and try to make them happen, you can bring good data scientists to, uh, to the table to bring that value. We've forgotten one important key, key issue that we've been painfully uh, uh, learning in software development life, life cycle themselves. And that is the DevOps, the DevOps themselves. We need to actually have the same kind of methodology that DevOps has changed in software uh, development mm -hmm. into machine learning deployments to production. And as part of the things that we can see as part of the cycle in the next slide, as the rough uh, uh, machine learning life cycle that you need to bring to the table whenever you are actually deploying machine learning to production. So first of all, a few statistics. You know that um, looking at, at a broad range of companies, it seems that out of uh, all the companies that want to deploy machine learning models to production, 55% have never done so. And that's a huge amount. That's really something that is staggeringly uh, painful to see because, I mean, we've we have worked to, uh, to actually bring this to the table with many different open source libraries. And it's so available and there is so many great courses online to actually make sure that the knowledge is there. Um, so where do we fail? Why hasn't this actually happened? Well, the first thing I can say is that there is no actual silver bullet. 
Contrary to common misconception, especially about deep learning, by the way, there's, it's not like I'll take this algorithm, I'll throw the data in, and I'll just get the results that I want. It doesn't work this way. And, and I have an analogy that comes from a completely different world, but I think it, it summarizes this in, in a good way, Chris. Cancer research. It, actually, in the 80s and 90s, you could uh, hear a lot of experts saying, listen, we'll crack this. We'll understand what cancer is. We'll understand with the research, uh, with enough research, we understand how to, re to resolve that disease. And it won't actually be along with us in the next 20 or 30 years. It will be resolved completely. And today we know that there is no such thing as the cancer disease. It's completely broken down into tens of different diseases that you need to be an expert in each. It's the same case with machine learning and with the data. You need to understand the data, you need to understand the model, you need to know how to combine them together, and only then you get to the hardest, harder part that you need to learn about the DevOps of machine learning, which is the two last cycles that we're seeing on the screen now. Now, there's another issue that I think is super important here, and that's the fact that data scientists, which they, they are great in uh, what they are actually uh, bringing to the table, and they, are, they can be great experts in making sure that they are uh, developing the right algorithms, there is still a technical debt there. There is a technical debt because data scientists don't actually have the expertise of modern dev development methodologies. And they don't know optimization in production, distribution of algorithms, uh, production deployment. Uh, there is a lot of other aspects like data, data freshness and making sure that basically we can, uh, we can make this whole diagram a circle that goes around and around again and again and again to improve the algorithms all the time. So DevOps is missing for data scientists, it's one part. There's another part is that because we need not only the data scientists along with its data engineers that prepare the data, we also need the product to, to uh, decide what is important and to bring the developers that actually deploy these algorithms to production and the uh, uh, DevOps that actually have all these methodologies to bring to the table and make sure that it is um, managed in a good way. So there is a non-technical uh, um, skill gap that is here and that is actually explaining presenting all of the ideas and what we're about to do and selling this, selling the idea of what we're bringing to the table, the ideas, the concept, the results to the leadership. It's something that no one teaches in any uh, data scientist school. So these two are definitely things that I think that data scientists, myself included, need to learn. And I'm doing this as part of my, uh, my experience as well, but everyone needs to get this. We need to be experts, not only in the algorithms, and we need to convince higher leadership to be along with us. I, th I um, think just to, just to add on to that with my own experience, too, like um, in a previous life, I used to work in an organization that had a division of um, data scientists, like four or five of them. Mm -hmm. And then we had a few software teams and um, we'd run into occasional problems that required data science analysis. And I did a, sh a short um, internship in the data science team just to learn a bit about data science. And so so uh, my, my first question was, um, what are you using for version control? And they were like, oh, there's, there's an FTP server. I was like, what? But this was like 2019. Um, and I was like, it's crazy. Um, but it dawned on me that data science is a very specialized field. You know, it's really, really uh, localized. And that means that those sort of generalist principles that are floating around the software engineering community don't really make the way over, right? And it's exactly that. It's, it's something that you, uh, you can hear about a lot of data scientists that actually take the weights on their algorithm, which is one of the key things that you need to keep versioning of. And just keeping a single version or like what we know from a uh, Microsoft uh, World or like dash final, dash final, final, dash final, final, the fine names. It happens all the time and we need to know better. We need to learn from our counterparts in the DevOps and the development world. It, it really can bring a lot to the table. Definitely. Just to add as well, um, anyone can ask questions at any time. There's no set question portion for this. So if you, if anything comes up on the slides, feel free to ask away and we'll answer them as promptly as possible. Um, yes. So. Sure. Um, so we talked about data scientists. Let's talk about the other part, leadership. So the leadership does have a few caveats here and uh, we're still on the previous slide, just, just to finish this. And, and in terms of what we're looking here, because it's such a complex issue, 
as an organization, there's so many, uh, so many organizations within the organization that need to be involved in this. It's, it's a different kind of engineering. It's not, it, these, it's longer life cycles of the, of the uh, algorithm themselves and running through production. It's different requirements. It's special maintenance that is not the same as just managing the code because you're also managing the data and the model and the weights. It's a completely different animal. So it's, it's something that needs to be understood on a leadership level. And on the other end, it's something that contrary to uh, engineering understanding, it's not just something I can throw money on it and it will be resolved. Like engineering issues, I can bring just many more engineers that are highly skilled and I will resolve the issue. But here we need a broader cooperation between different parties that talk with different kinds of languages and concepts that they need to, to be together. So the last statistics about this, and if this is staggering, that out of the 45% of the companies that have actually tried to deploy a machine learning model to production, 87% failed. And that is grim. That is really uh, something that we need to learn from, something that we, uh, we aspire to do better. And this is what we're doing part of CoreLogix and in the uh, development life cycles that we have here for the code and for the machine learning code itself, of course. Great. So um, let's look at, at what we can bring to the table using machine learning. So in the next slide, we can um, just moving on to uh, what's wrong with the traditional alerting and monitoring today? I mean, why isn't it enough? There's so many advanced tools, like you mentioned, Chris, Prometheus is a great tool that can bring you a lot of alerts about uh, like statistics that are uh, deviating for any metric that you're measuring. And it's, it's something that we use uh, in CoreLogix as well because it's such a great tool, but it doesn't really bring you the, uh, the edge here. And there are a lot of reasons for this. Because first of all, let's look at us as humans. We're not very good at a lot of different things. We're not very good at um, clearing the clutter. There is a lot of different uh, issues, that, a lot of different logs that just pop up all the time around your, uh, your production. And most of them are not interesting. We don't have a good algorithms in our brains to, uh, to find which are the most interesting parts. Now, whenever we are looking at the data, we're also missing all of these nonlinear correlations that happen. If we don't see start, end, right after one after another, and we just uh, expect to see them one after another, this will be easily recognized by a human, we won't find it. So complex relationships are missed completely. Now, there's another thing that basically, whenever we find a correlation, we tend to uh, ignore and neglect these small little differences, small changes that, uh, that do make actually uh, um, a difference because they add up together and they can basically move from, from their small differences to something that is much, um, much larger on whatever they are affecting downstream. Now, lastly, this is, this is easy to, to say for any human, we're never 100% in focus. So all of these four issues are something that as humans, we don't do as well. And while machine learning and any AI doesn't replace and hasn't replaced humans in general um, intelligence, and it will take a lot of time until we get there, but replacing us with these very specific issues like production monitoring can be very useful and you can actually use them to make sure that we're doing a better job. Now, I think, sorry, just, just to, tack on to that as well. Um, there's a very common problem that software engineers experience, right? Which is um, you arrive at a new company, um, you, uh, you you experience your first production outage as part of that company. So you open the logs. For any, for any engineer. Oh, it's character building. Um, but the, um, the, the, you see a series of errors in the logs and you go, ah, that must be it. And you copy that. And the senior engineer comes over and goes, oh no, that's those errors just happen all the time. It, that just, it just does that, you know? Um, that's something that, that you're, you're, you're literally looking for an error. You find an error and without that prior background information, it's like, oh, there's the smoking gun. It's null pointers exceptions over and over and over again. Um, but I think your point there is obviously that machine learning algorithms are quite clever at, well, that error happens all the time. We don't need to worry about that. Um, yeah, and, and you know that actually understand, actually hearing from, from someone senior at the company, that's also very, like something that blows my mind. That error is fine. 
That, that's, that's a crazy sentence on its own, but it happens all the time in all logging because that's, we're humans and we're writing logs and it's fine. I mean, yeah. we need to deal with how we're generating the data that we need to, to process. For sure. And it's about, you know, a great deal of software engineering now is the consumption of open source tooling, right? And we have to manipulate the open source tooling to do the specific thing we want. And sometimes that means just accepting we've got some errors. Um, it's just, you know, and, and that without very good error handling around that and very good prevention of what propagates into the log file, um, it's, it's quite natural to see errors coming out of a, a sufficiently complex application. Um, For sure. Cool. Um, so would you like to jump on to the next slide? So yeah, basically uh, looking at, at what we humans do, you know, not that well, but then we can definitely define rules any kind of alert that we want to be notified upon. And it's very easy to do so. But there is a caveat here because whoever is defining the rules, I mean, it's basically projecting what we have in our minds that can go wrong. And this is what we're putting onto the rules that will be triggering and will, will alert us. Now, it brings us to the next slide that shows us what's the issue here. On, on the right side that you can see, we can only imagine only the known knowns, only things that we are aware of and that we understand, we can write a rule that will basically trigger whenever this happens. But we're missing almost three quarters of anything else, everything else. We're missing the things that we are aware of, but we don't actually understand. So we don't know how to write the right rule there. And we're also missing, of course, the unknown knowns. These things that uh, we may understand if we look into them, but we're not aware of that they're actually happening. We are completely missing a lot of things here, for sure. And we definitely are missing the unknown unknowns. These are the things that we are neither aware of, and even if we were aware, we would never understand because it's too complex, and we need something to actually bring the insights out and have this uh, shiny ball of, uh, um, uh, of reflection to, uh, to understand what's happening. But then again, even if we have a very good uh, system for rules, that gives us alerts on whatever we need. These are basically defined across to, according to thresholds that again, we define as humans. So again, we're finding ourselves with non-optimal thresholds. These are thresholds that for the most part, they are constant, they are hard thresholds across most of the products in the market and across most development. You got just said, okay, this is the line. Whenever it crosses that line, I wanna know about it. And then you find out that on the weekend, on a Saturday morning, suddenly, uh, that threshold is way too low and you get a huge number of false positives. And then you get to a Monday morning when everyone's depressed and going to work for the first day of the work. And it's basically decreasing. Uh, you have a decreased amount of users in your system. And then that bar is way too high and you have false negatives. So this causes a major issue with alerting today. And uh, for the one part, it's alert fatigue. That's basically the same story as the boy who cried wolf. You disregard all these alerts that will come on a Saturday morning because you know they're not interesting and you will just wave your hand like this and you will miss the important ones. And on the other hand, you don't even know about the things that happen uh, on the Monday morning issue because the bar is too high. Now, lastly, when we're looking at alerts, these alerts only signal the beginning of triaging. I only know that something has happened. Now I need to investigate what's happened. And as you can see in the statistics on the left, is that 70% of the time is actually spent on understanding what the issue is, what is the root cause. It's not even spent on, on, on resolving it. And that's crazy on its own. I mean, we can use machine learning for all of these together to define the right rules, to make sure that we have the right thresholds, to make sure that we, whenever the, an issue actually triggers, uh, all of the suspected errors that are related to it are also brought to the surface. So we make sure we're not wasting precious time. You know, when I first saw that chart, I was super skeptical of it. I was like, what, 90%? No, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so I went, I went to my uh, uh, the, the software team in which I work, and we had a little conversation about the common errors that we get. And um, uh, someone had been keeping track of our mean time to recovery. Obviously a great metric. Um, but they'd broken that down. So they had timelines of when we first discovered the issue. And, you know, the, the fact that our alerts didn't pick up on the error means that it was taking us at least 95% of the time to, uh, to actually discover the issue. So not only was I wrong, I was more wrong than, 
than I thought it was. It's, it's, it's a bizarre statistic. Well, I can tell you the, the truth about this. It's probably that most, uh, this is a survey. I mean, it's given to people to understand, to, to say, well, I'm spending this and this amount of time on, on finding what the issue is versus fixing it. And we're too optimistic as humans. So the, probably everyone here is spending 95%. And it's the same experience as, you, as you've had. But we do think it's 90 or 80 or 70 or 50. So these are the problems, Leo. Um, shall we go into how we can use machine learning to actually fix some of these issues? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. And we talked about a lot of uh, what the issues are and, and where we can improve about this. But I think that in order to touch upon machine learning, we need to look a bit about just a brief uh, about the history of machine learning and what types actually exist. And then we can uh, uh, deduct from this, what are, the, um, what are the aspects that we can use machine learning for? Um, so on the next slide, we'll see a very famous image for a data scientist at least. What you're seeing here is actually, this is Elthus Samuel, um, one of the pioneers of machine learning, 1959. And uh, he defined it as the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. This is very interesting. It's exactly what we're doing throughout all software developers. We're explicitly writing rules of what should happen. It's very deterministic. Maybe except that pseudo random algorithms we're adding just to make sure that something is random. But then again, you run a set of data to, to whatever you're doing, user interactions and some uh, purchases and some API calls, whatever it is, you know what happens. And machine learning will basically saying, let's move towards where we want to be. We won't explicitly say what, what we want, but we'll direct it in that direction. And also Samuel basically uh, wrote the first uh, program that learned how uh, to play checkers. And it took him, I think it was around uh, 12 or 13 years of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of this research to get a computer at that time at 1970 or 71, he, he accomplished actually uh, winning against a, 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 like a, a, what do you call it? Um, and an experienced amateur, no, not the experienced um, uh, leaders of, of checkers at the time. By the way, you can look at uh, at at what uh, um, all the guys of you, you know, wherever you are now watching, wearing shorts at home or wherever you are, you can look how a data scientist actually uh, dressed to work at the time in 1959. This is the dress code, so it's a, it's a completely different world, of course. You can even see that it's, it suits weight below the waist as well, right? He, he committed to the full suit. Like, you wouldn't get that these days. <laughs> so let's look at uh, the different kinds that we have. We can look at, at uh, supervised, at reinforcement, at unsupervised learning. All of these are different kinds of algorithms that we use in machine learning in order to not explicitly explicitly write the rules that we want to, to occur. And the first part, the most easier to, want to uh, um, explain and understand is supervised learning. Here we're basically talking about gathering the input data. These are clearly defined with their output. So we have whatever it is that we want to classify, and we also have the right answer. And this is considered as the test data. So this label data, we're basically feeding it to the algorithm, we train it, and we, we um, change the weights of the algorithm based on the desired output. So every time it gets something wrong, we reduce the weights that caused it to make this wrong assumption. And every time it gets the right answer, we increase the weights that made it get to the right answer. And this way, we slowly make the algorithm go towards the belief of what is the right behavior according to the data we fed it. Now, <clears throat> there are two main algorithms that we can, uh, main concepts that we can talk about uh, in supervised learning. The first part is classification. Classification is basically um, when we do have a class of items, different classes of items, and we can take a new entity and say basically, which class does it belong to based on its properties? So in case of machine learning uh, on DevOps or in log data, we can ask, uh, after learning a few types of errors, we know that these uh, types of errors exist. What type of error does this particular new log belongs to? And it can help us understand what types of logs or what types of errors we have generally in production, understand which ones are rare, which ones are common, and accordingly act upon it. 
So classification deals with anything that basically has distinct classes. We also have regression. That regression basically deals with anything that is continuous and can deal, be dealt with a more mathematical kind of way in direct actions on the, uh, on the values themselves. So here we're basically looking at what are the correlations between different uh, aspects of the data, of the continuous data, and we can project what it will look like for any other uh, time frame in the past or in the future. We can also uh, try to project uh, what a specific value will be according to the rest of the values. So we can do a lot of different tricks with reg uh, regression. And an example here on monitoring can be, how many times do I expect this to see this error message, this particular error, error message type, uh, based on its history? So here we're getting another aspect of getting this kind of, a, of an anomaly detection by understanding that uh, this particular error is now happening more than we expected to. So even on that Monday morning, we do get an error that is not a false positive and it's not a false negative, it's directly where it should be. So that's for uh, supervised learning. Another type which is somewhat similar to supervised, but it does incur something that is a bit different is reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning basically looks at the world. We have a state in the world of something that we feed to the machine and we're giving it a very, um, uh, we give it, we're giving it a, a selection of actions that it can choose from. Now, whenever the machine chooses an action that is in the direction that we want, we can reward it, we can give it a reward. And whenever it does something that we think is not very, uh, not in the direction that we want, we can take some of this reward of it or even uh, grant some penalties. So, the, the main difference is that we're not doing this mostly immediately. If you take a game of Super Mario, for example, you can just let the, the machine play around, do whatever it wants randomly, and whenever it dies, it means that the sequence that it played, it gets penalties. So it is less likely to do that sequence again. But whenever it gets to the finish line, then it gets rewards based on all of the actions that it did, that it did in the middle. And that way we can prevent it slowly and slowly by learning what are the class of actions that we want to avoid. So in the context of, um, of uh, monitoring, we can look at this as, let's say that we already have an alert that is triggered, but it's not only the alert itself, we are also providing a set of what we think to be the suspected errors. So these suspected errors can be defined by the regression that we saw before. These are errors that have occurred, for example, more than we expect them to. Based on the, uh, on the uh, error that the user has chosen to be the most relevant, we can now give the algorithm scores that tell it basically, here you suggested the right suggestion, here you did not. And based on this, we can improve which suggested errors we're actually providing as the root cause analysis along with any alert that triggers. Is this, is this, this is how you make Mario. Like, <laughs> learn how to play, like, run on its own, right? The, the interesting thing about reinforcement learning in games, by the way, on this, uh, just as a side note, is that they find all these kinds of very, very neat hacks in games. They can yeah. find all these different behaviors that can increase the score if you're tracking just the, the top score that you have. And they can find that if you go in circles like this, then you may be collecting, that you are collecting every 20 seconds, you're collecting a bonus that, sun, that disappears and suddenly appears again. So this is all what it will do because that maximizes the long-term scoring of whatever it does. So they find a lot of interesting things uh, in these games. There you go. Um... Let's start just the next one. I to apologize, it doesn't seem to want to. Yeah, I, I think that you've frozen there, Chris. You can go back, a bit back. Yes, it does appear that my control over the... Well, it does, uh, I see the changes. So, um, so go back a bit. A few more. One more. <laughs> and one more. Okay, now we're at the right spot. So I guess you have an internet issue. I can see you like almost blinking, but that's fine. We can, we can uh, uh, hear your voice loud and clear. Brilliant, okay. 
it's, it's the, the voice is the best part of me, frankly. So it's very good deal. <laughs> very radiophonic, by the way. <laughs> so the last part is unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning basically does a completely different thing. Here, we don't have the correct values. We don't have correlations. We don't have relationships that we know that already exist. We just feed the algorithm with a lot of data. And what it finds are highly nonlinear correlations between the different points that we're seeing. There are no wrong or right answers provided. And what it basically uncovers is by automatically extracting what features it should look at, it can understand what, are the, uh, what things are correlated together and connect them to one another. So we can look at unsupervised learning in uh, three different aspects. We look at the first two and then dive into the third one, which is uh, deep learning in that respect. The first one is clustering. Clustering is very similar to classification, but here we don't have the predefined set of classes. We need our algorithm to define the classes on its own. We don't know how to provide them in advance. So here, basically what we're doing is letting the algorithm find what properties of our entities look similar to each other, and then it can cluster them together. And within that cluster, uh, we, can basically, um, we can basically say, okay, this is a, a new class. You can use the results of the unsupervised learning in order to feed the classification algorithm that we saw before in supervised learning. So they mostly, you can also, you can almost always see unsupervised uh, learning uh, play along with supervised learning of some kind. In the context of DevOps, what kind of error messages do exist within uh, this uh, set of error logs? So this is definitely something that we're asking a lot, and it's part of the things that we can uh, extract from the data. Another type is anomaly detection. This basically uh, asks the question of, please find what is the event, the single event or maybe more, that is dissimilar enough from what we expect to see and then highlight it to me and we can correlate that again to many different aspects as well. Um, in this respect, we can ask, based on the historical behavior of this error log uh, or this component, does it generate more errors than expected? So it can be similar to what we have in regression, what we heard before about that anomaly detection, but here we can put a lot of different aspects together that, that will automatically uncover what is the uh, anomalous behavior here, and it, there are a lot of different aspects that we can look into. Okay, Chris, are you still with us? You can move on to the next slide. Awesome. So the, let's look at the third part. The third part is maybe the thing that we have the most hype about, deep learning. Um, in deep learning, we're basically asking something similar. Uh, I see that Chris has a left. He'll probably rejoin in a few uh, minutes when he has his, uh, his connection uh, set up again. So in deep learning, we're looking at something uh, similar to unsupervised in many cases. There are a lot of different algorithms, but then again. Um, the idea is that we, we have a lot of non-labeled data. And when we have a lot of non-labeled data, we can just feed the algorithm with it without actually saying, please look at these parameters or look at this feature. We can tell the algorithm just run across this data, find whatever you find is interesting, and whatever is interesting, classify together, a, a, a cluster it together according to these properties. It's definitely something that uh, is super interesting because you take out one very hard step in machine learning that we haven't discussed yet, but it's the feature engineering that you need to uh, define what you're looking for within the data. And it brings a lot of uh, good results. So we look at the example of one of the first things that have came uh, uh, to be widely used in deep learning. Uh, specifically, uh, I think the first application was in the United States Post Office, the USPS, and it was how do I classify the postal code that is handwritten with handwritten digits, digits, and I need to classify this hundreds of millions of um, of a, a mail parts a day. So on the next slide, we can see how this data looks like. It's basically um, we have this is this is the classic um, data set that is known as MNIST, and it's sixty thousand black and white twenty by twenty pixel images, handwritten. 
Um, and we want to know how we cluster them together. We want to know which ones are threes, which are ones, which are nines, et cetera. So to do this, each, um, each image is actually flattened to a one-dimensional vector of 400 floating point values. These floating, floating point values are between zero and one. Well, zero represents the uh, a complete black and one represents, of course, complete whites. And once we have these, we can actually feed them to the algorithm. So on the next slide, you can see uh, the, um, the um, uh, neural network itself. For every pixel that we have within the image, we basically have an, a fitting neuron. You can see x1, x2, x3, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we have 400 input, uh, input pixels. So we have 400 input neurons. And we're just putting them there as the values, the init values. Now, each of these input neurons is actually connected to each of the neurons on the next layer. This is what is called a restricted Boltzmann machine. And it's one of the first uh, deep learning algorithm that was developed by uh, uh, Jeffrey Hinton. We'll send a link to, his, uh, to one of his uh, uh, examples showing exactly this, uh, this um, uh, in action. And it's amazing to see. Now, once we have all these inputs, they basically are multiplied by the weights. Well, each pixel, each two pixels that, uh, each two uh, neurons that are connected, they, are, they do have a weight between them. And we're multiplying the, uh, uh, the um, value with the weight. And then we have values showing up on the hidden layer itself. And we do this for every layer that we have in the uh, neural network uh, uh, chain that we're seeing here. And the process of learning is basically running this to the top and back to the bottom. So we have a full set end-to-end -end of these calculations running forward and backward. And we basically look at the difference between the original image we fed, we fed and what the neural network has done after one cycle. That difference, we're basically using the derivatives in order to have them change the weights. And this is the learning process. Hey, Chris, I see that you are now back again. Welcome back. So this is the learning process, and it's, it takes a lot of computation, really a lot of computation. Well, on the next slide, we can see how this actually, uh, what is it, this actually means. So uh, the next slide basically shows us what does each one, uh, each layer actually learn about the data it basically learns the features of the images. And these features can be the first pixel can light up whenever it sees, for example, a rounded uh, edge. Then we have a, a vertical line. We have a diag diagonal line. And each one of these pixels will light up whenever the image we feed it with shows these round, vertical, diagonal images, uh, uh, lines, et cetera, et cetera. So these are high level features of what we're seeing in the image. And every layer that we, we're moving uh, on and on to, uh, to the deeper um, layers of the network, we learn higher level features. So when I get to the last, to, the, to one of the very last layers of the network, we're basically seeing a 30,000 uh, feet uh, bird's eye view that looks at the images and understand, okay, this looks like something like this. Now, after this learning process, where each neuron can light up for whatever we have uh, as, as its uh, learning property, we can feed it with a new image. So this is the next uh, slide. And we can see here that whenever we fit with a, a new uh, image that it has never seen before, we take the 400 pixels, we feed it in here, the, uh, the input layer, and then only the right pixels that recognize these features slide up. And the last layer will basically only have 10 options only the options that we want it to learn, to cluster. And that will be the correct one for that particular image. And we can understand that these, these all belong together. This algorithm so, does an just, amazing just, job. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Um, just for my own understanding and hopefully some people in the audience as well, is it right to say then that from the left, it's very sort of, it's basically just pure input. Mm -hmm. And then the further right you go through your, neural network, does it become, does it operate at a greater level of abstraction as in? Do exactly. Yeah. Right. It's similar to the example we gave before when we're looking at an animal. So these features will still recognize edges, etc. but higher up, we'll recognize a face or a leg or a tail. 
higher level features which are more abstract. So this actually achieves an amazing error rate of 0.2%, and that's from Hinton's work. That's almost 10 years ago. We're even much better today, much better than humans can recognize any digit. That's, that's sorry, this is, I, I just want to, I think a common misconception about AI right now is that um, any emulation of human knowledge that it does, uh, like recognizing a digit, people are still better? Is, is that just a lie we tell ourselves so we, we don't realize the machines are rising up? <laughs> well, machines are definitely rising up for <laughs> the particular tasks. Yeah. It's definitely something that they're doing. They're better at us at not, uh, not having accidents on, on the road, even if they are, if the accidents that they have are very weird, but they kill less people. And they're very good at finding these very odd errors that never happen in production. And they're very good at playing Super Mario. So very particular task, we design a particular system, we can take the human along. But there are some things that we are very, very far away. I would argue that Super Mario is at least 25 to 30% of the human existence. So <laughs> it's, it's, a powerful, it's a powerful argument for the machines, really. <laughs> so let's look at, uh, at one such example. So we're not going to actually run the algorithm of clustering the data set itself, um, but we do have some statistics from it and it brings a lot of interesting ideas that we can look at. Um, the thing is that for most companies, for most production systems, they're generating hundreds or billions, hundreds of millions or billions of logs a day, even more than that. For large companies, it's an unusual amount of data that it's very hard to actually deal with. But clustering it according to the data types, according to the log types, gives you so much insights, so many insights that you can, it can blow your mind. So on the next slide, you can see the exact distribution. What we're seeing here is basically uh, each color representing the uh, a log severity. And you can see that most of the logs, or most of the types here are actually green. Green logs are info logs, that's natural. These are the most prevalent data for most uh, production systems that don't write debugs. We do see these colors along the way. Some places they are more condensed, some places they are less. Um, but the idea is that uh, the, on the y-axis, we actually have the log frequencies. These are log frequencies in log scale. If you see what I did here, never mind. But the idea is, <laughs> I, I love that joke, so I had to put one in, you know. But um, the idea is that you can see how, how prevalent these logs are. I mean, if I look at the top 10 logs of a, of a typical production system, the top 10 types of logs represent 60% of the data. It's a crazy amount. It's a crazy amount of data. That's all the clutter that we we're talking about in the previous slides. If we remove this clutter and we only view the very rare logs, we're solving already the most difficult issue of us as humans trying to investigate something. Now, if you look at the graph towards the right, you see that it becomes more and more colorful the more we move there. And the reason is because these are errors and criticals and warnings that they're basically rarer than the others. But we can also notice that we can definitely differentiate them from what you mentioned before that expert at that company that you said that told you like that error is fine. That's error. These are the errors that are found at around 120 on the X axis. They're very common. We don't need to, uh, to relate to them. We can clear them along with the rest of the clutter. Let's look at the ones that are more rare. So it's definitely this division between looking at statistics and getting alerts on them. Uh, it's basically the next slide that shows where are the areas of interest here. We want statistics on the very common ones, even the errors that are uh, occurring so, mu so much. And we do want to know whenever an unusual exception happens and, and we've never seen it before, if it's just one log and it's within your 200 million uh, logs that you've shipped today, you definitely want to know about it and, and take action upon it. Great. So I just want to um, get into that a little bit. So on the left-hand side, we're essentially saying that we get these great volumes of logs and we want to kind of understand these at a high level statistically so we can understand how our system's behaving. Mm -hmm. um, how come these logs in the middle aren't quite so interesting? Well, these are actually common logs, but they are common to less common actions. That's what we see. Right. 
Yes. I mean, if you have 100 features in your product, then you probably do have these 50 features, at least, that are not that common uh, to be used. But whenever we do use them, we see all this middle ground. And this is where a, a lot of data is actually interesting. But when, when we clear up, when we're investigating a particular feature that is not very, uh, uh, that is not used very often, uh, you will see the exact same, you would just take a, a zoom between 400 and 450 and you'll spread it and you'll see the same behavior. This is what you basically see. That makes sense. So, um, just before we get into the summary a little bit, uh, Leo, um, just, just, just to wrap things up, it, you, you, you've been influencing sort of machine learning algorithms uh, for a while now. And I was just wondering, for anyone in the audience who's watching this webinar and thinking, right, my turn, I'm going to go and build some machine learning capability in my company. Have you got any advice from experience uh, for things to do, approaches to take, stuff to watch out for, scary stories, anything like that? First of all, it's a great task. I mean, something that if you decide to go about it, it's very exciting. And you do need to understand that you will fall a lot and many times on the ground. You will have to lift yourself up and make sure that you're proceeding and that you're progressing again and again. And it won't be the classical thing that you know from software development for DevOps. It won't be that service that suddenly doesn't, uh, doesn't have its port open and, and you have to dig like a hundred uh, hours into the logs and documentation to understand what's, what's the issue is. It's a different kind of animal. So there's, you definitely want to go to something that um, impacts the business. I can tell you that as developers, and I've been developing as well, I'm not only a data scientist, um, it's, you always want to go for the, the exciting technology or the exciting issue or the exciting problem that you want to solve. And it's something that relates to a lot of, of emotion. Sadly, we have to put that emotion for a second aside and understand what will impact the business. And that is what you will get the, the people around you to care about it and, they, and to, to make sure that they are aligned with your interest and make sure that you are, um, that you, that you are progressing in, towards the, um, where you want to get. Um, I, th there are a lot of other things that we can, we can discuss here. I mean, uh, you need to have the right people aligned. I mean, I mentioned this before with the leadership. You need to have someone that is actually sponsoring this from a C-level or some VP that will make sure that it's, it's their project as well, because there are so many aspects of the organization need to be aligned here that it won't work unless you have, you have coordination across. And if, and if you want coordination, then you want someone from above to actually dictate this and say, you're spending two hours on every Sunday on this, with this uh, gentleman, because otherwise it won't happen. And everyone knows how everyone is super busy. It will be uh, pushed to the side and it won't happen. Um, and I think that as we talked about the business value, I think it also relates to what kind of algorithm that you're choosing. With the, the amount of hype that you're seeing on deep learning, you have no idea how many times I've been asked the question of, which deep learning algorithm you're using? Which one? Which one? And I can tell you the truth that many of our algorithms are not from the, the deep learning uh, uh, scheme. We do have some, but but yet most of them are not uh, from deep learning because they they make the job. They do the job, and you need to choose the simplest tool for the job. If you choose something that is more complex, then it means that uh, you will get a lot of trouble in in the way. It will. It won't have. You will need to invest more research and development time. You will need uh, the deployment will be difficult. The scaling and distribution will be difficult, and the real-world performance will be difficult to predict. And then the cycle that we saw in the beginning will be so long that it will fail, as all the eighty-seven percent of ML projects to production fail. So I, I think these these are definitely important points. Um, and the last part that is super critical, and people always forget about it. It's not about us and about what the company is interested in. It's always about the customer. It's always about the customer. And you need to close the customer feedback loop quickly. And I can tell you from experience that we have several machine learning algorithms that I myself invested a lot of time in, and they are now in the machine learning graveyard because they did not uh, provide enough value. And you need to be sensible 
to your customer and not to yourself and to take something you've invested a lot of time in to understand that it's not good enough and to throw it and replace it with something that is better. And that's what we're doing constantly all the time. We're improving current algorithms, we're introducing new ones, and we're throwing the ones that, that uh, um, do not meet our expectations. And it's part of the process, and it's part of what you have to live with. Thank you very much for that, Lee. That was fantastic. Um, so just as a brief summary of what we've covered, um, we had a conversation about the transition of machine learning from sort of the fringes into the mainstream. Um, why traditional alerting and monitoring kind of falls short and how machine learning fixes that. Um, the different approaches to machine learning, the, uh, the various types of learning strategies that people take, the supervised reinforcement and unsupervised learning. Um, we went into an example on deep learning, um, which was a selfish part that I liked because I have no idea what deep learning is, so all good with me. Um, and finally, we, we tied all of that together with a case study that brought pretty much all of those techniques into a um, single example about how CoreLogix uh, can use these on a regular basis to create value for our customers, but also um, just to really personify uh, the experience of using these techniques in a, in a company environment. So um, just before we wrap up, um, there are a couple of questions that I've uh, taken note of. Um, so um, we're coming towards the end of the webinar now, so if you do have any questions, please fire them through. Um, so uh, quickly, Leo, um, how long have you been working with machine learning and can you recommend any resources for someone who's just starting out? I promise that someone isn't me. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, um, I've, I've been in this uh, in, in CoreLogic for the last seven years, but my background is actually coming from, a, in, from neuroscience, uh, first and second degree in neuroscience and in, in computation, uh, minoring in computation. So it's a lot of algorithmic uh, analysis that we've done in, uh, during, the, during my studies. Um, and it's a we got a really solid background on the mathematics. So it's something that I can tell anyone. This definitely was a requirement for anyone who wants to deal with machine learning. I think that today it's, it's, it no longer is. You can definitely be a good uh, data scientist uh, without deeply understanding the mathematics, which is great. Note that you will have a huge advantage when you do have the math behind you um, and supporting you in that, in that uh, context. Um, so first of all, I think that, that that should be clear. It's not to scare anyone uh, off. It's bringing more people in. That's definitely what's happening in data science in general. Now, in terms of, uh, of resources, um, you know, there is there is one very famous course from Andrew NG. And Andrew NG, I think I should, uh, I should write this um, here. Andrew NG has a very good free course in Coursera. He's one of the co-founders at Coursera, if I remember correctly, but he's also one of the pioneers in machine learning. Uh, it's a great introductory course to a lot of different aspects of machine learning and in all of the different um, uh, supervised and unsupervised learning and all the, the aspects, along with some mathematical explanations, you do need some um, linear algebra in, as part of the background. Uh, and I think that if you want to go anywhere in machine learning, this can be a very good starter. Um, because this means that you understand what types there are. It doesn't take you to the real practice of deploying it into production, but you can go from there and have a deep dive on whatever subject or, or aspect that you want, whether it's uh, deep learning or otherwise. How, how long has um, CoreLogic sort of made use of machine learning? Is it something that's been there from the very start or did you kind of bring it in as the company went on the journey? Well, the, the thing is that, um, we came to a world of, of logging that in our perspective was already broken. If you look at when the company was, uh, was assembled at late 2015, uh, 2014, um, that you, you could nearly un uh, understand by instinct that the more and more data is generated, it will become prohibitively costly to actually have people watching over any issue that there is. Now, it, it became broken in two ways. It's not only about the human resources that you needed to invest. And along with that, of course, the computational effort that you need for the databases, for the indexes, for the search engines, for whatever you, you, you have to, to make it, to enable these people to look at the data itself. So these two cannot scale. And on the other end, it was clear that we need some kind of an automated way 
to make sure that we're extracting the valuable parts out of it immediately, how, the, the fastest that we can. And we basically brought these two solutions to the market. The, from day one, it was about machine learning and making sure that as a data platform, we're ingesting the data, we're analyzing it, we're extracting our uh, insights, and, uh, and then we can do whatever we want with this. We can throw it to an S3 bucket, we can put it in Elasticsearch, just as an example, but we have the insights. And this allows us to basically reduce the mean time to detect issues using all of the different aspects that we talked today about, the uh, reducing mean time to detect by having anomalies and alerts and all of these classifications and regressions about the um, uh, anomaly detections that we put from the data, that we extract from the data. And on the other end, we can scale the, uh, the, the system and the scale the costs in a non-linear way because we're running a streaming platform that extracts the insight and we don't need to keep the raw data on expensive hardware. So it's, it was always about these two issues. I, I know I, t I tend to extend my answer, so I hope I got, I got everyone's uh, mind aligned with what I wanted to say. That was brilliant. Um, just one final question, I think, uh, as we're sort of coming close. By the way, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to fire them in. Um, but one that came through is, uh, you mentioned for unsupervised learning um, that you require a great deal of data. Uh, how much is a is a great deal of data? Are we talking like is that a, you know? And and can you give any examples of, of the kinds of data sets that one would use for unsupervised learning? So, in in unsupervised learning, and definitely when we're going going to to deep learning, and it's true to any machine learning algorithm. Basically, the more data that you have the better of a model you can learn. You can, you can, uh, you can, um, uh, you can learn, yeah. And the idea is that basically when you're, when you're trying to, uh, to divide a, a data set into, uh, into hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of, of different clusters or classifications, you need to have many more multiples of that in order to have a, a classification of what that bucket actually constitutes. Otherwise, it will just be in a, um, a, that the algorithm will learn a bias or an overfitting of that, of that bucket, it depends. So in, in most algorithms, you can definitely have enough for simple tasks. If you have a few thousands or tens of thousands of examples, it will be enough. When I mentioned that you need to have a lot of data in deep learning, it's something huge. You need to have like hundreds of thousands is just sc scraping the surface. Now, the good thing is that in the monitoring world, we have no such issue. We have so much data that we can contribute to other people if we'd wanted to. But there is, you know, companies are generating billions of log records a day. We have all the data that we want and we can train any algorithm that we want. The question is just what will bring the, the best value and what we can bring fastest uh, to the table. Just had one last question come in, so we'll, we'll, we'll answer that one. Um, if you, if we want to implement machine learning with AWS, what type of ML would you suggest? Hmm. Well, I, I don't think there is this particular one that um, that I think that is the right answer here. Um, I mean, AWS has their own uh, package, um, has their own services to help you build machine learning. I think that if you are a startup and the core product that you basically uh, are developing is not something that is related to machine learning, but it's just a helpful feature that you want to add on top of the, the main offering, then you should definitely go to, the, uh, to any uh, managed service uh, that, such as AWS SageMaker that they're that they offering, because it will shorten the time to market and this is the most important thing. We, we, that was the last part that I mentioned in the summary, where you, are, you want to make sure that you close the customer feedback quickly. So it will allow you that, and it's definitely there. Now, the downside is that you are now tied together with an algorithm that you don't control and you can't find otherwise. And that means that you are tied to AWS. So we, from the, day, from the first day that we started CoreLogix, we decided not to go to that route. To be uh, uh, to be basically uh, on any cloud that we want based on our choice and not based on the services, and that's because machine learning is a core offering of CoreLogix. So if it's your core offering, definitely go to open source. 
And then you can go to many different aspects. I mean, the first one that is the easiest to go, uh, it's uh, the, um, uh, the SK Learn um, uh, package from Python. It's definitely the get-go for any uh, machine learning tool that you want. If you're going for deep learning, then I think that PyTorch, PyTorch is, uh, is the, one of the most popular ones, also on Python. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Theo. Um, so that's all we've got time for today. Thank you so much for attending. It's been a brilliant, brilliant talk. We also thank you very much for that. And um, pay attention to the email that comes out after this uh, webinar. It will contain uh, a series of links, uh, articles, uh, that, that sort of thing that will help supplement the material that you've seen uh, in this webinar. Um, thank you very, very much for your time, Leo. Uh, absolutely brilliant. You've filled a great deal of gaps in my knowledge anyway, if anything. So. <laughs> Um, and I do apologize for the technical issue. Um, thank you, Chris, and thank you everyone for joining and spending the time uh, to hear about uh, about what we had to offer today.